thesis works now. Yay! Okay, so here are the basics. Sacred falcons are the second largest falcon species in the world. They're the second fastest animal on the planet. Um, <clears throat> their habitat is in central Eurasia and some into northern Africa. I'll get into more details later, but this is our agenda for the evening. You and you want to improve your seats. Yeah, because um, there's going to be some really good videos on here, so you do want to watch those. And also, this is a weird falcon species. They actually prefer mammals over the classic, what you think of falcons, like the peregrine falcon, and that's going after birds. And they are an endangered species where they live. Anybody know that? I bet you know. Falcon? Yeah, that's a jeer falcon, which is a North, a North American species. It's an Arctic species, so we won't see that. And so I said they were the second fastest species um, of falcon. Obviously, the peregrine falcon is the fastest, so they're going to rumble. That's in Medina over there. That's just a stock photo. So the, there is a big difference between the two and how they're, they hunt, their strategies. And so this is a peregrine falcon. This is not my photo, otherwise. <laughs> All of the, this is a little falconry note here. <laughs> this bugs me. That's way too much equipment for one bird, but I like the position of the bird. So. Um, peregrine falcons, what they do, how they hunt, is they're up high in some poor unsuspecting pigeon, like that one is minding its own business, and they will stoop, they will be shaped like a bullet, 200 miles an hour, and what they'll do is just before impact, they'll put their feet out, and it's an impact, and that's why you see the big explosion of feathers, and it is a very um, dramatic, very hard impact, and usually that kills the prey, keep going so very intense way of hunting um, for them so and if the impact doesn't kill the, the prey the bird right away it does stun them that's why you don't see them usually grab it they just they hit it and you'll see the prey just kind of fall the falcon comes back and will go down and will step one foot on the head one on the like this area and when I get her out you may be able to see it but they falcons have a a notch on the top of their beak, it's called the tomial tooth, and then they'll just bite and sever the spinal cord. So it's called the kiss of death, that's what falconers call it. And all my birds do, all my falcons do that, their toys. Mm -hmm. Little Finley would be trying to kill his toys with this kiss of death. So that's how these guys hunt. So then you've got the sacred falcon, that's not in Adena. The way they are is because they hunt mostly mammals, and so they're a straight line pursuit. So if you got mammals, obviously, to come out of the sky and then hit the ground at 200 miles an hour would not be real good strategies for survival. So they're more like a straight line pursuit, and they can reach up to 90 miles an hour just in hard court, which is a lot of power. So, and then it's, it's all power on the ground. And that's actually a photo of Inadina's first kill, which we'll get a video of that. So their preferred habitat, they're an open landscape, grasslands, very wide open, and a lot of trees, you won't find them in you know, forests or heavily covered landscapes. And so semi-desert plateaus, very much like here, but obviously not in this part of the world. So this is where, um, this is their main, where they're nesting, their permanent residency is right here where a lot of them are that live year round or and or nest. Um, they are migratory. And then this is more of where they spend their winters if they do migrate. The numbers are quite low here. And I had a very hard time finding a lot of studies that came, I don't think I found any actually, that came out of any of these countries. So the favorite food, mammal. <laughs> Looks like our prairie dogs. I've never seen a sus look in real life, honestly. But and then also the cute little lemmings and hamsters and things like that that everybody thinks really cute until they come home in your house. And then if they do hunt um, avian prey, crow seems to be one of their favorites, which is interesting. Crows are not dumb. <laughs> I don't want my birds going after crow or raven. Because there's, I think, two or three different species of cesselix, and they are ground squirrel. So this is taken from <coughs> another study. It's actually quite old. Um, and so there's two. You can see how much they actually prefer the mammals over the pet hamster. And then, I forgot this pointer thing. Um, and then, so, they will eat each other. I don't know what the story was behind that, but, um, but. 
So I just thought this was a really interesting photo. I don't know if that's really actually a suslick, um, but three pounds. That, so a cotton tail is about two pounds at its largest. And Leroy, my Harris hawk, when he catches them, this is a bucking bronco ride. So to take on a three pound squirrel is, that's a lot. They don't, I guess they do run quickly, but the teeth are what's, what's so that's, 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 um, that's formidable prey right there. That doesn't look like it. I, it doesn't look like it's probably a wild one either. He looks like he's been eating a lot. But that is their favorite food. And then they do come in different morphs or colors. So this bird I just pulled from a stock photo. So this is a blonde. You know, it's what the falconers in the Middle East are really like these. I don't care less what color my sacred falcon was. I'm sure it would be a good bird. This right here is Kubala. He was my male. I would say he's about in the middle. And I didn't notice until I put this photo, but see how he's got dark feathers right there and then some are light? So the lighter ones are feathers that he didn't molt out that year. So they don't molt every single feather every year. And then, of course, this is Inadina, and she's very dark. So, and then they are an endangered species. This is Kubla when he was still alive. Um, he's, he's quite light. And I took this from the IUCN red list. And we see the reason, main reasons why that there, there's three that are the main reasons why they're um, endangered. Electrocution, habitat changes, and illegal trade. It's all human impacted. So there is nothing really for birds to perch on. So if you have big, huge perches, they're going to use them. And because they are a large falcon with very long wings, they complete the circuit and electrocute themselves. And they've been doing, for many years I know of, that they've been making modifications and trying to discourage from them either landing on it, or if they do land on it, it doesn't complete the circuit. But, um, and then for one of the habitat changes, one of the major ones is in Mongolia, you have the nomadic herders, so they move about and they have all their animals with them, and all the animals are eating the grass, so the grass is staying really short. Well, just like with a lot of stuff, we're losing this ancient culture, and you know, the kids are growing up and going into cities and not taking this on, and also why they're losing evil falconers as well. So I'm like, well, you know, what do the herders have anything to do with it? Well, when you've got short grass, apparently the Sussex like short grass because tall grass interferes with their view. So if you're a Sussex and you want to stay in guard, you can't do that when you've got grass in your face. So the Sussex have actually moved out of the area, so now there's no food for the birds. This is a part I don't like to show, but it is what it is. Um, so the Middle Eastern falcon remark. This is a little graph that, oops. This is a little graph that shows, um, this is the illegal take. It was way up there, I think this is like 2000, this is 2015, 14, so. Yeah. And then that right there shows the decline of the sacred falcon members. So they are having a huge impact. And the reason why they're so into the sacred falcons is you know, Middle Eastern falcon is one of the largest falcons because it's all about the you know, size for them. Well, the largest falcon species is a deer falcon, which is an arctic species, which doesn't do well in the Middle Eastern desert. So what they do is they take a sacred falcon, which is the second largest species, hybridize it with the first largest species, and because they're a desert species, it helps the jeer falcon handle the heat. So, um, and not to worry, there is a lot of research, a lot of conservation, hot on everybody's trail. So, sacred falcon, you know, being the understudy, forgotten stepchild of the falcon world is now a big deal. Um, and they are listed as, as endangered, so it's, you know, they're getting a lot of the attention that they deserve. Everybody feel like a sacred falcon expert now? Sure. You go to the pub and just... So, let's see if I have any stats on her. So there she is. So she's captive bred. Obviously I can't trap. So as a falconer, I do have state and federal permits that are edu for education and falconry. I can trap, if I wanted to fly a red tail, I can go and trap a juvenile <coughs> red tail. Um, obviously I can't go do that with a sacred falcon because they won't live here, so I have to go to a breeder. And 
also my permits require that I, I use captive bred birds for education. So anyway, that is her when she was born on April 16th. And she was born in Missouri, and that's when I picked her, that was a, oops, man. Um, that was the second I picked her up from the airport and actually sitting in the Delta cargo parking lot because um, I got her out and made sure she got water and took a picture. So she was only two months old there, or just barely two months old. And she's already full grown. And she was yeah. yeah. So um, so she, she got off the plane and she's been a busy girl. So this was her very first education program two days after I got her in the airport. She actually probably wasn't feeling well, so I did pull her back. Um, she went to the vet, and I gave her some um, time off at her first education program. So she's going to be a heavy education bird as well as a falconry bird. Um, I do a lot of this kind of stuff, but I also take people out in the field and do falconry and raptor experiences. And then <coughs> that was at the Hummingbird Festival as well. When you can, she's been busy, and this was all before she was trained, which is why I get that look right. <laughs> I like this. She's like, what are we doing? And she was hooded most of the time, but in these photos, she's not. So she's a, she's a very confident bird. So I don't know if she was really. So fast forward, this was Friday, no, Saturday uh, in Sedona. So she's gotten quite used to being a celebrity. You can see she's quite calm right there. And, and this was at um, his show, and then this was actually at the end of August, yeah, um, at the Arboretum, just showing everybody how she does her lunar work. So she is quite busy with the education in this. So she started her training on August 1st, and <laughs> this is how her first day went. So she comes to a thing. So that's a pair of dry quail wings with yeah. a meal on it, and that's a that's a lure. That's how falconers keep their falcons fit, because falcons have a head. It's called a heavy wing load. So they got this big, you know, heavy football-sized body, and that's to so their um, keel, their sternum is shaped like this, and all birds are, and that's to accommodate huge flight muscles. Um, fal uh, hawks and eagles and owls certainly have a lighter wing load, but you got falcons with a long pointy wing, so they're doing this all the time where hawks and eagles can just kind of, owls don't have to do anything, they just sit <laughs> um, and fall on their prey. Oh, look, a skunk. Also with all my other birds, if they're not a falcon, um, they're, it's called wedded lure, that's my insurance policy, so if I do a long, which I won't do it with her in there because she actually knows what I mean, it's a long whistle and I say hope at the end, that's her cue that I've pulled out the lure, and that's an automatic jackpot to her. So I need to get her to come down quickly. And it, almost every single bird, almost every single time, if I have to pull that whistle out and they're flying away from me, they will actually do a U-turn and come back in their flight, which is what you want. And then, okay, here's all the blown guts. So this was actually her first live prey. It's a pack rat. And um, so she, I didn't do it very long. So on August 14th, she's still not fully trained, but she did catch her first live prey, and that was a, um, a pack rat, and she did not hesitate. So what I'm gonna do with this bird that's different than any other falcon. So how falcon nerves fly their falcons is it's called waiting on. So somebody will put a peregrine falcon up, and they almost always have a dog. I don't know anybody that doesn't hunt with a dog that has a falcon. And it's called waiting on, so that falcon is up there flying and they're walking the field looking for, like say, grouse, and the dog will point, and that tells the falcon and there's a covey of whatever bird they're hunting, and the falcon's up there waiting on, and then the bird, um, the falconer will cue and flush the covey when the falcon is in the right place and go down. Her, I'm gonna hunt her on jackrabbits. So she's being trained just like she's a hawk. So 
she's going to sit on the fist, on the glove, and apply off the glove. So that's why hers is a little bit different than a normal falcon. And then this is day four weeks, and now she's learning to be a brat. So what she's trying to do, she, I got a tidbit, she's trying to steal it and keep going. So I just thought I would show that by week four, she's like, oh, I got this all figured out. <laughs> yeah, well, she did it, I was like, mm-hmm. So the third time, I just grabbed her talon. And so there's the lure. And eventually, I'll swing, so what I do is I have that and I swing it, and she's up there flying free. Um, all the equipment's off, she's up there flying. And then she'll come in, it's called coming in for a pass, and I'll present the lure and then pull it away and then she pulls through and goes up. And it's just like a big game of keep away. And that keeps them fit. For so this was her two days ago. So you can see her, she's not really listening. So I can hear her, oh yeah, her weight needs to come down. So this is the most she ever flew. So I think she was kind of like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Yeah, she's only um, five months old. <laughs> so when this stops, um, and she's very bossy, you can hear her fussy, she's very fussy. So that's her ground lure. So what I do with that is I hide it in a bush, and then when we're walking around, I'll pull it out and give my, so when my birds, when I flush a rabbit or whatever game I'm, you know, mostly I hunt cottontail and jackrabbits, I'll scream H-O-H-O -H -O, like Santa, that's their cue that I've flushed a prey, although they usually know before I do. Um, so that's what I'll do is I'll pull it out and go, oh, she's like, oh look, the stuffed squirrel. It's actually, uh, yeah, it's a stuffed squirrel that Leroy pulled the head off, so it doesn't have a head. So this right here is GPS. So I fly all my birds with the transmitters, so, and then this one is radio telemetry right there. <coughs> so I can find her both ways. So you can yeah. see her, <laughs> close to some degree, but so they mantle to hide that. And also when you're, there it is. Um, I knew that was coming. <laughs> also, um, when they're on the ground and they've got a kill, they're vulnerable, so, so she knows that I'm here, so she's trying to, <laughs> this is her new thing. When I'm talking really close to her, she knows I'm here, so she thinks I've got food. <laughs> Hang on. Boink. And she's got her head. <laughs> So you see that she's going like this. So our eyes, we can move around in our skull like this. They can't do that. So what she's doing is trying to figure out how far away everything is. And falcons are really pronounced when they do it. I mean, all birds of prey do it, but falcons really do it. And then that's also why they can turn their heads 270 degrees to compensate for fixed eyes um, and very binocular vision. So her vision is eight times better than humans mine probably like 800 times better and then um, so if she could if my birds could read which since they're all geniuses I'm pretty sure they can put a newspaper in one end zone and my bird in the other they can read the newspaper 100 yards 